Man, oh man. Uh, this is what I call a singing congregation. <laughs> y'all don't sing here, y'all are singing. <laughs> wow, what a blessing to be a part and sitting right up front so I can hear all, man, it's amazing hearing all of you all sing. Uh, I'm greatly encouraged by it and hopefully uh, you'll be encouraged by this message from God's word. In uh, the 60s, there was a song that came out. It's by someone whose last name is DeShannon. And it goes a little something like this. What the world needs now. Y'all know the rest. Uh, love, sweet love. That's the only thing that there's just too little of. Can you think of any truer lyric than that one that was written all the way back then? We look at the world that we're in today. What's missing is love. But not just the love, that, that pity pat love, you know, that puppy love. It's not that love that's missing. It's godly love that's missing. And there's two things that I come to mind that remind me of what godly love is. And I want to share those with you today. Godly love, first of all, is a choice. We choose to love people. You see that pity pat love, that falling in love? Y'all remember that feeling when you, when you met your boo, right? And you, you didn't want to eat and you, you had all of those emotions and those butterflies in your belly when they came around? That's easy love. That's falling in love. The world needs love from people who choose to love. Even when love isn't coming back, love is a choice. Godly love is a choice that someone makes that I don't care what you believe in. I don't care how you vote. I don't care what your skin color is. I don't care what slogan is across your shirt. I don't care about any of that stuff. I'm going to love you anyway. That's what the world needs. It doesn't need that I love you if you love me back love. It leaves that I'm going to love you anyway love. And another thing that determines godly love from, from the rest of the love that we might know is it's supernatural love. This is the type of love that, that breaks the natural order of things. The, the nature says you love people that love you. I love my family. I love my friends. I love the folks that take care of me. But Jesus says love your enemy. Church, that's not natural. That takes us beyond natural to a supernatural realm. The world needs that kind of love. If you read in the text of Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 through 48, I don't have any slides today so we're going to have to get out our Bibles or get out your phones, but, but I, I, I promise you I'm not going to make anything up. If you want to just listen, you can. But if, if you want to fact check, fact check. All right, that's fine too. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48, Jesus speaks on this very thing. He says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. And I believe Jesus is calling us to be supernatural. In a world full of people who just want to remain on that natural level, people who just want to love folks to love them back, Jesus is calling us, his people, his hands, his feet, to love, love, love with a godly love. It's a choice and it's supernatural. It took a situation in my life to help me understand this just a little bit better. I spent several years as a Middle school principal, it's a great joy. Being able to work with fourth and fifth graders, being able to help them through difficult times, being someone that they can come to, it, it just, it makes my heart feel great that I had that experience. But there was an experience that still to this day, sometimes I cry when I think about it. But I had a situation where a young man came in to school 
He was rude to his teachers. He was rude to his friends. He was disrespectful. And when I went to correct him on it, he was ugly and disrespectful to me. So I had to call him in my office, and usually I, I de-escalate and I talk down, but he just kept on going. It was, was not like him at all. And he kept going to the point that I finally said, if you don't stop, I'm calling your father. And he looked me square in my eyes and said, do it. Woo! <laughs> Challenge accepted. And I picked up that phone, and I dialed those numbers hard. And when that man answered the phone, I said, sir, let me tell you about your boy and what he's doing. And I went, I went in, as the young people say. And I started telling him all the things that his kid was doing and what he was saying and all of that stuff. And I was so mad. He had pushed all of my buttons. And he said, hold on, Mr. Kirk. Someone's at my door. And he let them in, and then he came back to the phone, and I took a breath, and I went, and let me keep going. And I started going in even more about all the rude and horrible things his son had done. And then he says this to me. He says, Mr. Kirk, I'm sorry. I want to apologize on behalf of my son. And then he says this little three-letter word, but. And as a principal, I hear that but, and that means to me, let me tell you why my baby's special. <laughs> let me tell you why my baby, the, the rules apply to everybody else but not my kid. I'm sorry he acted this way, but let me tell you why you should excuse him and his behavior. What he said wasn't that. He said, but I just let hospice in. He said, I'm going to be dead next week. He said, we just informed our son, and we've been telling him all this time that I was getting better, but we can't lie to him anymore. And we just told him that he has at most a week left with me. He says, Mr. Kirk, I'm sorry. He's acting this way. He knows better, but he's going through a lot. Can you have grace? Can you have mercy? Can you be there for my boy today? And more importantly, can you be there for my boy next week? And next month and next year, and I'm not able to be there for him. Can, can you do that for us? He says, you know, I felt so small. Felt so small. Because here's the thing the behavior of this young man was still rude. That, that hasn't changed. The actions that he did were still wrong and against the school rules. The only thing that changed in this situation is my knowledge of what he's going through. And with that knowledge of what he's going through, my heart went from anger and frustration to love. In an instant, I wanted to hold him, and I wanted to cry with him, and I wanted to talk to him, and I wanted to tell him it's going to be okay, and I, I wanted to tell him, I know you're scared, and I know all of that stuff, but I'm going to be here for you. In a moment's notice, I was ready to change. And all it took was for me to understand what he was going through. The point I'm making, church, is if you want to love like Jesus loves, we got to know people like Jesus knows people. And the fact that Jesus had a supernatural ability to read people's hearts and to know them and to understand them, I believe that was the secret to his ability to love the unlovable, to be able to hang on a cross and to be tortured and beaten and to look down on those folks who are mocking him in that moment and say, Father, please forgive them. It's because he understands. He knows them and he understands where they're coming from. And I submit to you this afternoon that if you want to love like Jesus, you got to know people like Jesus. You got to take some time to figure out what's going on in the lives of the folks next to you, your neighbors, the person in the pews with you. You got to get all up in their business, not to be nosy. But if you're going to love the way we claim we love as Christians, we got to try to understand. See, there, a couple months ago, a couple years ago, there were some people walking around with some slogans on their hats. I didn't love them too much. And, and those folks, they didn't love me. But you know what conquers that love, that hate? Sitting down and saying, help me understand why you believe what you believe. Help me understand what's happened in your life. How did you get to this point? Oh, I didn't know that. I don't agree with you still. 
But I understand, and that understanding makes it easier for me to, to love. Had a conversation with a young lady who was a lesbian. I had to help me understand how, how one can, can do this. And, and, and I say this to this room full of Christians because I've heard sermons from the pulpit about homosexuality from people who have never sat down and talked to a homosexual before. Right? Like, how backwards is that? And so here I am having this conversation, and I'm just trying to understand, and I'm just trying to get, and I'm just trying to figure out. And she says, listen, my whole life, my stepfather and my brothers raped me every day. I hate men. I don't want to be touched by a man. I don't want to be looked at by a man. I can't stand men. I don't want to be around men. And that's why I am the way that I am. And you know what? It doesn't make it any more right, but I understand a little bit better. And that means when I have a conversation with her, I know how to approach that conversation. It's not with a broad brush. It's with a love that comes from understanding just a little bit more. Church, if we're going to love like Jesus, we've got to know people like Jesus. I want to show you in the Bible where this comes into play. If you look at Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 39, we have this situation. It says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at a table. And a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissing them and pouring perfume on them. Verse 39. Get this, because here's the irony. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who it is that's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. But the irony is Jesus does know who she is, and that's why he has the mercy, and that's why he has the grace, because he knows the trauma that she's inflicted throughout her life. He knows the abuse that she's been through. He sees it. He knows it. He understands it, and that's why he's able to go beyond the surface where the Pharisees stop. All they see is a woman that's a sinner. Jesus sees a broken person that's worthy of love. And because he has a deep understanding, he has a deep love. And I suggest to you, in this beautiful, this beautiful room, I suggest to you that there's some people you're going to run into when you go back out into the world. Some folks that are hard to love. Some folks that might get on your nerves. Some people who might believe differently than you believe or vote differently than you believe because that season is coming. Y'all better buckle up. But wouldn't it be amazing if when that season comes and the world is on fire about politics, there are pockets of people who choose to love rather than throw insults at each other. Wouldn't it be great if those people could be marked and, 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 and known to be, oh, those are Christians. That's why they're not spewing hate like everybody else. Look at them loving people that disagree with them. It would be a beautiful thing if we were able to be like that. But it takes us getting to know the other side. Love also calls us to correct our brothers and sisters. Did you know that? Did y'all know that? We're supposed to correct each other when we're, we're wrong? See, that's something we don't, we don't like to do nowadays. We see someone doing wrong, we like to do this number right here. Do, 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 do. I, did, I didn't see nothing, did you see nothing? But if you love that person, you'll be willing to have an awkward conversation. If you love that person, you'll risk them being mad at you for getting in their business. But here's the thing, church. We can't try to correct somebody when we have to introduce ourselves first. Let me say that again. I can't come to you and try to correct you about your living if I have to say, hello, I'm TJ. By the way, you're a sinner? No, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. That love 
comes through getting to know, listening, speaking, having coffee, talking, investing. Back in the day, I'm sure you good folks in Texas never had this phase, uh, but there was a style of dress when I was a young man in the 90s. It was called sagging. Y'all may not be aware of that. But it was the cool thing for me and my friends to walk around with our pants a little bit low. And we would buckle our belts and we would walk around and we would, it was cool. And every once in a while we would slide them up a little bit and that was just, that was just our thing. It's a wild time. And people would say something to me every once in a while, you need to pull your pants up. Sometimes I say some stuff back to them. But you know who I didn't say anything back to? My grandmama. When my grandmother said, baby, pull your pants up. Yes, ma'am. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, Grandma. I'm so sorry. What's the difference between a stranger telling me to pull my pants up and my grandma telling me to pull my pants up? The difference is Grandma's done praying for me. The difference is I've eaten at Grandmama's house. The difference is when I was sick, I laid on Grandmama's lap and she rubbed my back. The difference is that woman loves me, and I know she loves me. So when she speaks to me, even when she's correcting me and she's telling me stuff I don't want to hear, I listen and I act because the investment has been made in me from her. She has given her time. She's given her energy. She's given her resources to me. So when she speaks, I listen and it's not an issue. Before I even went into grandmama's house, I would go, okay, 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 put your pants up on. Okay, it's cool. And then I would go in because that woman loved me. You might have a member of your family, you might have a neighbor, you might have a brother in this room that you know is not living right. But if that brother doesn't know you love him before you decide to come up and correct him, you're going to have a problem. The love that Jesus requires of his people doesn't just happen overnight. It happens when we set aside time to know them so how do we get there? Well, when I was a young man, I uh, used to play basketball. And on this military base we lived, there was a basketball court in the center of the base. And as a 13-year-old, all of us would get together. It was kind of like the sandlot, but for basketball. And we would just get together, and we would have epic battles after school. And during the summer, we would get there early in the morning, and we would play all day long, and it was just fun. I know kids today don't understand playing outside, but it was fun back then. One day my mom says, take your brother with you. All right? My brother's 10 years younger than I am. So if you do the math, 13, 10 years younger, that's three. <laughs> that's three. Now, I didn't understand it then, but now I'm a father of a three-year-old now. She was trying to get that little rascal out of the house. So I take him to the court. I'm mad and I'm frustrated. And I'm playing basketball. I'm doing my thing. We end playing and I say, all right, guys, y'all have a good one. James. James is not there. Y'all, my three-year-old brother is not in the park. And I'm looking and I'm searching and I'm screaming. And the sun is getting lower and lower and I'm crying and I'm scared and all of that stuff. And I have to walk home to tell my parents I've lost my little brother. And I walk in the door, and my dad is sitting there with my little brother on one knee and a belt on the other one. <laughs> Y'all, I got toe up. I got a country whooping. <laughs> my father said, this is your brother. He is your responsibility. You watch out for him. You take care of him. You protect him. You look out for him. And so what would happen is when we went out again, I didn't want another one of those whoopings. So while I was playing basketball, we'd be playing, and I'd go, time out. James, get down. Stop it. Don't let me come over there. All right, time in, guys. Let's go. And we'll play some more. And we play a little more, and I go, time out, time out. Where's my brother? Hey, 
leave my brother alone. Stop it. Hey. All right. Time in. And we'll play. And we do it. And then eventually it just got to a point where I would call timeout and everybody on the court would start looking for my brother. <laughs> Everyone would. We find him. He's okay. Hey, he's over by the playground. He's good. All right. Well, let's keep going. Point I'm making is in order to know the condition of my brother, as busy as I was, in my words, I had to call timeout. I had to check on him. I had to look for him. I had to make sure he was okay. Because I love him. And in your lives, which I know are very busy and are consumed by a lot of things, if we're going to love like Jesus, you have to call time out on your world, on your activities, on your, your jobs, and all the things that consume your time to be able to check on brother so-and-so, to be able to call sister so-and-so, to be able to, to ask questions of that person at work that you don't seem to be getting along with, or, or that person that lives a lifestyle that, that you just don't understand is kind of messing with you a little bit. We have to take time to do it because it's not going to happen by accident. We have to be intentional about it. We have to be intentional. It won't happen passively. Loving like Jesus is not something you fall into. It's like anything else we want to do. We've got to work on it. We've got to make time for it. We've got to practice it. We've got to do it. And I know it seems like extra, but this is what Jesus calls us to do. In the passage that was read to us before I got up to speak, in Matthew 22, the Bible tells us, verse 37, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. That's most important. Love God. But not just love him a little bit. Love him with everything you've got. How do we get to a point that we love God with everything we've got? We're growing in our love because I imagine you love God more today than you did 10 years ago. Amen? And the reason that happens is because you know God better now than you did 10 years ago. So you've been through some things in that period of time. You've spent some time on your knees praying and with tears coming down your face. You've spent some time in some hospital rooms and in the ER. You've been through some things where God has come through and you know that he's going to come through and you've been, you've seen it and you, you just know him better. That's how we come to love him with everything we've got. We spend time in his word and we read about how he's been there for others. And if that's how it's going to come across for us to love God more, look what he says in the next verse. He says, this is the first and greatest command. But in verse 39, he says, the second is like it. Love your neighbor. He doesn't stop there. He gives a condition says, love your neighbor just as you love yourself. The season is coming where party lines are going to be drawn. Blue and red and all everything else in between. And if you're on social media, you're going to see it light up like fireworks. Don't let that happen in the church. You don't have to agree with everybody to love them. Agreeing is not a part of what the Jesus says to you. Loving is. And loving is more than a feeling. Loving is action. Loving is doing. Loving is serving. Loving is helping. Loving is taking care of. Loving is all of that stuff. And it becomes easier for you to do that with people you know best. And if you're going to get to a point where you can love people like Jesus loves people, you got to call time out on your life. You got to get to know them a little bit better so that the loving and the helping and the serving 
and it's just a little bit easier for you. I'm not expecting that this happen, this change happens tomorrow, right? But I'm hoping that when you go back out into the world, you got a new plan. You got a new desire. You got a new passion for people. Even those people that get on your nerves. Especially those people that get on your nerves. That you love them the same way you love yourself. And that you love them the way that Jesus loves you. I don't know where you are in your walk. And maybe you need some help getting there because there's some people that have hurt you in the past and you don't know if you could ever love them. I, I, I get it. I get it. But you got brothers and sisters that are here to help with that. You've got elders, you've got preachers, you've got sisters and brothers who have been through life that can help you through it, that can pray you through it, and all of those things. If you find yourself in need of any of those things and anything else in your life, please let it be known as we stand and sing.